Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Bullhorns and Sirens with your hosts, me Sam. Tommy, hello. And me James, hello. Nice to see you both. Yeah, you too bud, you too. Uh, that sounds like it's not nice to see <laughs> but it is, of course it is. Um, we are here to talk about burnout on this episode, which we're not going to give an episode number two because who knows when it's going to come out, it might come out after, before, who knows. But yeah, burnout, it's really common, isn't it? In Especially in the NHS, and I think that it's getting worse and worse. And Organise did some research, and they found that 78% of NHS staff are considering leaving the profession due to burnout. That's 78.5%. That's quite a lot, isn't it? Are you in that? Um, I have my up days and down days. There are definitely days when I'm like scowling through indeed and nhs jobs and then i'm like why am i scowling for nhs jobs when the nhs is what's causing me my burnout but um no no not at all i i think yeah i've definitely felt burnt out at times um before i was a paramedic when i was an emergency care assistant you know i've definitely felt it through throughout the years where is or who is sorry organized where you've got that statistic from who are they yeah, so Organise, I think they're like a company or a charity, and they basically empower workers by giving them the tools that they need to sort of understand what's going on in their work, to just empower them, really, in, in lots of different things. And I think that what they did was a questionnaire across the across the NHS to find that 78.5% are considering leaving due to burnout. Interestingly, though, I mean, as in, like, to have that statistic, fine, but given that a lot of NHS staff tend not to participate in surveys and questionnaires. I wonder like what their audience of that 78% was. Like, was that only like a hundred people that filled it in? I you know, know, who knows? But yeah, interesting. But I think you like, the more people you speak to, you know, whether they be your colleagues or people you meet along the way, no matter what profession they're in, whether they're with us in the ambulance service or they're, you know, nurses, doctors, etc. Burnout is definitely more of a bigger issue, more, common than what it probably used to be and more recognized as well i guess you know the term burnout do you, have you got a definition for the term burnout i do and um so it's by some people called maslack and jackson don't worry i'm not going to ask you who they are um i don't know who they are <laughs> but um they defined it as a sustained response to chronic work stress involving the three dimensions of emotional exhaustion depersonalization and a perceived lack of personal accomplishment. Can I ask what depersonalization is then? Yeah, yeah, and you know, I think that's quite a common uh, question because to be honest, even I didn't know what depersonalization was or or couldn't really properly define it. But after doing some reading in, and it's um, a common to feel uh, depersonalized, but it doesn't get explained very often. It's basically a feeling of being outside yourself or an observer to your own actions and thoughts. And to be honest, I've felt like that quite a lot and it's normally when I'm sort of going to sleep or driving or something like that, my mind will go into a depersonalization where I, I I feel like an, obser- an observer to my own actions and thoughts. Have you felt that before? So it's like an out of body experience? Yeah. But not out of body, like out of mind experience. Yeah. Um, With that driving, is that like, is that like you drive, you're driving home from a shift and then you all of a sudden find you're at, the services, driving past the services, and you think, I've just done five miles and I've got no idea. No, it's not that. That's not depersonalisation. Because oh, okay, if it is, uh, I get that a lot. <laughs> that's just sidetracking. Um, that's, just, that's just not being focused on, on driving. Um, oh, okay. But yeah, but what it is, so when I say driving, that might be a bad example, but if I'm driving on the way home from work, you can think, you can think about work and think about your actions at work and... And, and things like that. Think about your thoughts from from work and stuff like that. So like you reflecting on your day, basically. Kind of, but it's more of a, rather than a reflection, it's a, um, you're just observing what happened as opposed to like asking questions about it. Okay, sure. Yeah, it makes sense. It, it, like I said, it's really difficult to, to explain. That's kind of what the definition that I've got of depersonalization. But it's the sad ob- observation of yourself. It's not like looking at it going, I did that pretty well, or I could have done better on that. It's not like a reflection. It's it's a sad observation of yourself, like going, oh, look, you know, looking back on, you know, looking back on what you've done throughout the day or your work or whatever. 
you're just not feeling yourself. You're looking you're looking at yourself from a from an outside point of view, probably in a negative way. Maybe I don't know. Okay, sure. But I've I've felt that sort of uh, before. Yeah. I don't know if you guys have. I, I I don't know if I maybe subconsciously, but I don't think I've I'm not consciously aware that I've ever had that moment. Yeah. But I've definitely felt burnt out. But I don't. I don't feel like I've ever de depersonalized. I don't think I've ever depersonalized. But then I might well have done and just not realize that's what that was. That's it. Yeah. And I think that you know you can know that you that you feel burnt out. And then if someone says to you, "What? Why? What is being burnt out?" And you you go, "I don't know," but I just know that I don't feel right in myself. And um, it's and just I, I it's just like exhaustion of the job, and just feel like you've been pushed to your limits. You've run out of like. Just, just like resourcing, like you just feel like you're. I don't know how to describe I think, it. I think if I can chip in, like it, not necessarily physical exhaustion. Like we all get, you know, we all do a a heavy lift or whatever, you, and you you feel, oh god, my arms ache. I think it's just like mental exhaustion, just like you know, having to obviously just be thinking constantly. You know, we were talking with with John before in a in a previous episode. Um, you know, he's having to think of high acuity all the time. You know, his mind must be running at 100 miles an hour. And I think it's like that sometimes. It's like, oh, my mind's just gone. I've just checked out. That's it. It's emotional exhaustion, isn't it, at the end of the day? And so emotional exhaustion is another point that we were going to break down, weren't we? And sometimes at the end of a shift, you can just feel mentally exhausted, can't you? And you're tired. You're not physically tired. You might not have even done much, but... You know. Oh, I'm definitely physically tired. <laughs> That's just because you're unfit. Well, actually, no, you're, you're not. Really Ow. That's, oh, that's really awful, awful to that say, isn't mean, it? That was really mean. To be fair, you've, you've been hitting the gym recently, Sam. You've, um... Are we going back on this again? Didn't we like cover this already? I don't know, though. Yeah. Cold showers and uh, gym sessions. It's going pretty well. Yeah. But um, but yeah, and and that's a big that's a big thing that I, I know that people feel emotionally exhausted when they're when they're burnt out and feeling emotionally exhausted. Um, can literally just be feeling fatigued mentally at, at the end of the day, feeling frustrated or, or tense or getting really annoyed easily. Those are signs of being emotionally exhausted, aren't they? So that emotional exhaustion, I think, from my point of view, is, yeah, like you said, getting frustrated, X, Y, Z. But for me, I also tend to sleep loads as well. I'll sleep loads, just like... I mean, I can sleep like a teenager anyway, but just even more so... I want to eat loads as well. I tend to get on a bit of a binge and scram some naughty food, which is cheeky. But that's that's kind of when I've realised that I'm emotionally exhausted. It's definitely the sleep. And I know, if, I know for some people, for me, that's one extreme. I sleep loads. For some people, they might not sleep well at all. It might be the complete opposite. That's it, yeah. For me, I'm one of those. I, I don't sleep much when I'm emotionally exhausted. So I'd say I... I think I can sleep well, like that doesn't really bother me. I sleep less easy when I'm exhausted because I let a lot of it play around in my head and I think that sort and I, I struggle to keep focus on things. I lose focus with, with sort of emotional exhaustion and stuff. But I think, you know, a big part of it as well is it completely depends on the day you have. Like for us in the ambulance service and I'm sure for, you know, nurses in wards or in A and E and, you know, midwives and such, you know, we all are gonna have a very different experience of our day and it could just take one really like lengthy job you know to exhaust you and tie you out whether that be because there was a lot of physical bits to do you know whether it be like a, a resuscitation or a trauma job or something like that or whether it be because you've just put a lot of your time and effort into empathizing and sympathizing with uh, a patient of a medical need or a mental health need i think that in itself can take a lot out of you um and then when you then end up doing that back to back with minimal rest in between jobs because you know the call stack is always waiting there's always jobs outstanding and there, there's very little downtime i think you know that's when it starts to grate on you so it's interesting you say in there sam about workload so obviously again i I know we keep relating it back to the ambulance service and I'm sure again it's the same across all services in the NHS. Once upon a time, you know, you would get that little bit of downtime here and there. You know, you speak to some of the guys that have been in the job, you know, many years, you know, they'd they'd go and do a job 
come back to station and that'd be it for a couple of hours they had that downtime whereas now we're finding you know we're, we're job to job we're job to job hospital back out hospital back out leave someone at home back out you get your quick turnaround for your meal break and then you're back out again and it's just persistent all the time constantly do you find in uh, and i mean i don't mean this in a jokey way for a change but do you find in your specialism with heart for example that you don't have that same out and out or are you guys still as busy as uh, you know do you has it eased your burnout by being in that different role? Yeah, so as as we know, Hart, you know, we are a little bit steadier than the normal ambulance crews, which we're quite lucky for. There's obviously reasons why we are steadier. You know, we're we're there for the the bigger the bigger incidents, um, and I noticed a massive lifestyle change for the better. Really, when I went across to Hart, just having that little bit extra time. You know, we're still doing stuff on station. You know, it's not like we're sat around twiddling thumbs all the time. You know, we're still having to do jobs on station doing some training and bits and bits and pieces here and there but it, it definitely eased you know my quality of life is so much better since going since going across there just not being out all the time there are certain days where you know we're out job to job to job all the time just depending on what's going on but definitely is easier and better you yeah, know i think that um, but then sometimes when you go to the really low acuity jobs say you know if you do a run of four shifts for example and you it's, it sounds bad to say this but you know people on the job will know will completely understand where I'm coming from if you just go to people who don't need an ambulance those really low acuity headaches the the mild abdominal pains the you know the the jobs where you know there's not really much for you to do other than you know practice a, an assessment or something and take them to hospital or something like that and I think that can cause emotional exhaustion as well, can't it? And that can then you start wondering whether you're bored at work. And and that's what I was saying. You know that it's that whole the jobs that you go to day to day, like they they're the ones that will eventually grate on you and cause that burnout because you feel like you're not fixing the problem and you're not helping anyone anymore in the way that you were expecting to help people by doing the job. And I know, like we touched on in you know uh the episode with john john where although it, it's not about us it's about the the patient and it, it's their moment of need and their moment of crisis absolutely but you know equally it does weigh down on us because we're there and although the patient may feel oh they really helped me and they really made a difference to me and i'm sure no matter how we're feeling we all do our very best to go above and beyond for our, our patients you know for us it's it's the other way around where we're we we're not feeling what the patient's feeling where they feel they've been helped we're feeling the opposite where we're like actually uh, you know you're my second patient of this uh, problem you know in the space of yeah. two hours and I, I just i wanted something else i don't feel like i've helped you today you know and it's that frustration you start to beat yourself up about it and it grates on you and i think a reason a lot of people get into healthcare and into our profession whether it be ambulance service nursing midwifery doctors is because of the variation that the job offers. A lot of people do it because they don't want to be sat behind an office, you know, or in an office behind a desk, Monday to Friday, nine to five. People enjoy that shift work. They enjoy the variation and the fact that, you know, you never know what you're going to next. And that's the thing that I think keeps us going is that mystery of, yes, it may be the same job next, but you don't quite know what you're going to get when you walk through the door or when you arrive on that scene. You, You just... And I think that's the, that little bit keeps you in, yeah, you, but you've got to ask, is that enough to keep you in and stop it. you from moving on? You know, you wake up in the morning and go, I don't know whether I'm going to go to people falling over with minor head injuries all day or whether I'm going to go to a five car or a 10 car pile up on a motorway or something like that. You just don't know. And I think that's definitely what keeps me motivated to go to work every day. And without without that variation of, I think it's a variation of acuity that we need as opposed to um, presentation. You know, we can we can see an abdominal pain, a headache, someone you know having leg pain or falling over, but because it's the same, it's it's not varied in level of um, severity, right? That we we then get bored, and. If we if we sort of if it varied a bit more in terms of the yeah like I said the acuity that we see or the severity of of the condition that we see, I think that 
might be better for, for our burnout. I mean, the thing is, is that you can't go to someone and go, I need variation in my acuity of patients because that's impossible to say. But, you know, if it would be good if, if they could, wouldn't it? I think some of the... Um... Somebody said to me, and I think it's quite a uh, an unusual description of our job, but they described our job as almost like a toxic relationship, um, in the sense that like you keep coming back for more because every month or two months or however often it is, depending on you know where you work and, and all that jazz, like you get that job that you've been waiting for, that you've been holding out for, that big incident, that patient that you feel you've really helped, whether that be whatever you're into, whether it be major trauma, whether it be uh, cardiac arrest, or whether it just be making that little difference to a medical patient or whatever, you get that job and you're like, oh, that's what I needed, this was it. And you're like, oh God, I love this job so much, it's amazing. And then you have a month, two months, where you just go back to, you know, like what we're talking about. And you're like, oh no, I, I'll stay, I, I'll wait for the next one. And it's that sort of toxic relationship with the job where you're like, yeah. you're just holding out for the next time the job's gonna treat you well. Mm. Um, I was gonna go back to what you said, Tom, there briefly about the variety. And and obviously, you know, I obviously now on heart, but once upon a time, I. I was split working between a DCA, a double crew ambulance, and in the, the control room working in the clinical hub because I was just on that run of routine, doing the same type of stuff, not a massive amount of variety from an ambulance point of view. You said then, Sam, about these, you know, these more interesting, these these slightly bigger incidents, and I just wasn't getting them. And that I, that was like, I was just not getting burnt out necessarily as such, but emotionally was, was struggling a little bit and I was like I need to mix this up I need some variety here and ended up going across into the control room and, and doing remote triaging over the phone there and I think we're probably going to talk about that in a little bit about doing some variety and stuff but um, yeah that can definitely help so I think that leads us on nicely to uh, talk about lack of personal accomplishment which I know you said comes under the definition of of burnout and, and obviously I definitely felt like I wasn't not achieving anything because I was still doing my job, still seeing patients, still treating them, but just just didn't feel like I was achieving anything. You know, I wasn't. I don't even know what the word is to be honest. It's like when you you're just doing the same thing every day, right? And you yeah, you're helping people and you're seeing different things, but you're not working towards anything. And I feel like that in the NHS, that that part of that definition of burnout, the lack of personal accomplishment, it really resonates with most of the staff because. Once, if you're a paramedic, you know, once you've finished your degree and you've done your NQP period, what are you kind of working towards? And I know that you can work towards yourself and everything, but, you know, it's difficult. What do you think, Sam? So I would say that with the sort of workload being how it is, it's hard to find the time to go and do more things to further your career unless you're on, like, a, you know, a trust-approved education program, you know, such as, like advanced clinical practice or you know critical care or urgent care or anything like that it's hard to get the time off the road to then go and explore other sort of education routes either that like are self-funded or you know cpd and things like that which will sort of help aid with that feeling of being burnt out and wanting to achieve more mm. and then it sort of becomes like a vicious cycle doesn't it because you want to go out and do more but then at the same time you don't have the time and then you sort of become demotivated and you lack the the want to then go and do it because you're so exhausted all the time. And then you just ends up in this little cycle of, oh, I really want to do something else. But you know what? I haven't got the time. Oh, do you know what? I just can't be bothered. Yeah. And then you just, you end up in that vicious loop. And I guess you've got to somehow find a way to break that cycle and, you know, find whatever it is that you want to do to break your, your feeling of burnout. But I feel like we we have such a focus on or such a way of trying to break burnout by moving on to different things rather than trying to fix the problem where it lies and you know that's that's what causes probably the under resourcing the understaffing within the nhs is because rather than us focus on retention of these amazing clinicians at their grades what we do instead is we push them out of the job into other educational roles or other areas to try and reduce their burnout and it leaves you with less experienced clinicians 
being your frontline facing clinicians but where like years ago for example in the ambulance service you know which i think james touched on before you know you would like come in maybe do three four jobs a shift and then you'd have downtime in between you kept your clinicians because they weren't feeling burnt out and so you kept them for a longer period of time you know you look at the like long service people you know the uh, the technicians the the paramedics that have been there for 20 odd years and the reason being is because when they started the workload wasn't so heavy yeah. um whereas now it's a lot easier to just turn around and give up and say do you know what this isn't going to get any easier and so people get only a certain level of experience and then they turn to something else that's it yeah and as soon as you qualify you're always asking oh so what are you going to specialize in or something like that yeah absolutely i remember you know like qualifying and that's the, that's the question that people ask you is like oh so what next and it's like do you know what I just want to focus on being as good a paramedic as I can be because that's what I've just worked really hard to achieve yeah. I you know I didn't just walk on and walk off of a course and and that's it you're now a paramedic you know I worked hard for it and now I'm there I'm not ready to move on I know you get your years as an NQP a newly qualified paramedic but I want to stay a paramedic past that because I want to get that valuable experience and I want to make sure that I'm comfortable in my clinical practice. Um, the same as I think many people should. You, you should want to feel comfortable where you are before you start looking at all these advanced, glamorous looking roles. It's one else because I'm not going to try and put anybody off university being a paramedic, this, that and the other. However, an interesting point came about, you know, as we were getting towards the end of the course and, and the lecturers were saying so, not sure this is I don't show if there's, this is evidence based or wherever so do take this with a pinch of salt but they were saying to us you qualify as a paramedic and then at seven or eight years you're hitting a burnout point now whether that was seven eight years you burn out and you leave the service completely I don't think that's what was quite meant by it I think it was like seven or eight years you burn out you have some time off or you do a role change or whatever and then you come back and you, you're sort of good to go again type thing and that was when I qualified in, in 2015. And I imagine now we've thrown COVID into the mix, which I know we're going to touch on. That's I wonder if that's even short in that seven or eight years to, to even less. I think they say about three years post-qualifying now, you're, um, that's like your, your average burnout time now. Really? After three years. Well, cause it, was, it was five years, wasn't it? Like your average burnout is you'll get a paramedic for five years, in our profession anyway. Yeah. I'm not sure if it's the same for nurses or worse for nurses. I don't know, but in my trust, we get a lot of, well, actually, a lot of trust in this country. We get a lot of international uh, paramedics in, and they do their two years, and they go, I'm going to go back home now, but I don't actually want to be a paramedic there. And so they, uh, a lot of them are burning out just after two years. That's interesting. And it's, it's, it's mad. But do you know what I found is, I'm on this Cumbria apprenticeship paramedic course, and as a tech, I was um, I was burning out. I was literally feeling like I was giving up with the job. I was getting stressed at work really easily. And it's only since I've started this course that I felt actually I'm and it's I tell you what it is lack of progression. So I'm on this Cumbria course and I've got something that I'm working towards. And I think that that's sort of reducing my burnout. I was just going to say sorry when you said like as a technician you felt like you were getting burnt out. What were your first sort of like frustrations and signs that you've realized oh something's happening something's different i was getting um a bit aggy with patients i say aggy agitated with patients that's the better way of saying it but yeah you know um i was getting bored of the job i would be going to patients and stereotyping them into this group of people who just love wasting our time and um and it wasn't you know it wasn't the you know even the people that do need us i was getting bored of it i just wasn't interested in the job and I was just feeling, why am I coming to work? You know, you've got, and the other thing that adds on to it is we have targets, don't we? We've got handover times that we need to keep to. And you got, we've got managers sort of bringing us in saying, you know, um, you need to improve your times or, you know, your paperwork is, I mean, I know that these are all important things, but it still adds weight onto your shoulders, doesn't it? So, yeah, I don't know how you felt. I know, I know you said that you felt a lot better when you joined Heart, James, because it's that sort of lack of progression that you might have been b feeling towards the burnout and then once you've got something that you can now work towards you're feeling yeah, less burnt out yeah definitely i think yeah i think you've hit the nail on the on the head there definitely with that one and it might be why that people are so quick to ask a paramedic what they want to specialize in because they know that then they might not last that long 
It's sad, a fair point. sad, sad thing to say, but you never know because it, you know, you never had that even 10, 15 years ago. From I mean, you know, I was only a, I was only about three years old, fifteen years ago. But, um, <laughs> yeah, and the rest. Do the maths. <laughs> but yeah, um, so you know, I don't know what it was like that that amount of time ago, but I, I'm I'm sure that they, people didn't go around to go, no, oh, what do you want to specialise in? What do you want to do? You know, once you're a paramedic, you're a paramedic. But then I would say all those years ago, there wasn't specialists, and there wasn't like specialisations only come around like in recent years, like so. Um, the critical care program in a trust that we know of you know that was developed around 2008 2009 um but before then there was no progression routes a paramedic was a paramedic and that's the thing you know it it was the be all and end all in our profession was to be the paramedic and now which i know you're right I'm, i'm grateful that we've you know progressed and and our profession is becoming much sort of more um educated and evolved. yeah evolved thank you that's that's a better term um and you know and, and we're so lucky to have that evolution of, of our profession and to have these specialists but like and, and maybe that's a good thing for burnout because it does give people who want to stay in the profession they're burnt out with their current role but don't want to leave the ambulance or don't want to leave the nhs or whichever part they're in you know to have these specialisms whether it be acp or um you know paramedic uh, practitioner that there's there is that uh, motivation to reach for something else mm. but yeah no, no that's cool yeah and like we touched upon a little bit about just the signs and symptoms but um the uh maslach and jackson these guys that defined it um they actually listed out a load of signs and symptoms and we've touched a lot upon them but it's things like sleep that well change in sleeping habits and you said you slept more sleep deprivation is one of them as well changing in eating habits increased illnesses due to a weakened immune system and i've definitely had that before where you think to yourself why am i always getting ill all of a sudden and maybe that's what it is you know there's there's loads of things and i think that if if you you know we're all going to get burnt out we all probably have been burnt out before even the people listening and and I think that um, just looking at all of the signs and symptoms online there are good are good ways of sort of recognising burnout early because once you recognise it, it's good to then tackle it and um, and work on something to to stop it. But um, COVID was a big um, cause of burnout, wasn't it? And that really, that if you think the the big waves only lasted maybe what a year and a half. Yeah, COVID was was such an interesting one because. All of a sudden, we're presented with this new virus that we don't know anything about it. As far as we were concerned, it was if you get it, it's potentially game over. You know, that's it. You're dead. Yeah, new information was coming out all the time. There was a lot going on. I remember obviously being out on the fr- on front line. You you were having to ring hospital, going, "I've got somebody who's got a cough and a temperature. They might have COVID." You had that background worrying. Obviously, at first, I know when when COVID hit, everyone was scared to ring for an ambulance, and then it eventually picked up, and we were we were really really busy again. And I remember that was quite a an interesting shift from going from busy to fairly calm back to really busy, and and I definitely hit the point of of burnout. Just I was just emotionally drained with with everything that was going on, all the new information that was being fired out, all the new procedures we had to follow, and and I was I was. I needed a holiday and I couldn't go anywhere because we were in lockdown. That's it, yeah. <laughs> and all the cleaning, infection prevention control precautions you're putting in place, you know. But before COVID, all you used to do was just, you know, just wipe down the life pack and the blood pressure cuff, wipe down the bed, and that was pretty much it, wasn't it? Like, where when COVID was around, you literally had to do the whole vehicle, you had to do all of the bars, all of this, you had to, to wipe down all of... I remember getting a Clonel wipe and wiping down my uniform because I was so paranoid about bringing it back. And, like, that is causing emotional exhaustion. That's part of burnout. And no wonder why uh, everyone got burnt out. You've, you're going to the same job, the same calibre of patient, difficulty in breathing, cough. That's that's. There's no progression there. You're not working towards anything. You're forgetting about... Because you haven't gone to somewhere abdominal pain, or you haven't gone to someone having a stroke, or you haven't gone to a road traffic collision, you're forgetting about those things. Because all you're dealing with is respiratory patients, so you've got nothing to work towards. There's no, there's no personal accomplishment that you're going to other than surviving. Because that's what it felt like, really, didn't it? 
Um, and, you know, it's, it was really difficult and there's no surprise um, that, that COVID caused burnout. Um, especially in nurses, they had it even worse, you know. They had to scrub up or whatever in their in their PPE and they weren't even allowed to leave. They had to stay in their uh, PPE for a certain amount of hours, otherwise they were wasting PPE. Um, you know, I've got friends who said that even when they wanted to go for a wee, they were just told to hold it in until their time was up and then they had, had to, they then they could doff, which means take everything off, um, and then go and use the toilet, come back and then put everything on again. You know, because it had to be new PPE. That's crazy. That's crazy having to hold a wee in for that length of time. My bad bladder. That's awful. And you're trying to deal with people who are dying on a ventilator, because uh, that's what they're all dealing with in there, and they, they're having to hold a wee in. Um, you know, it's, it's mad. So wh- why, why don't we flip this then? So let's, you know, we've talked a lot about burnout and getting to that point. Just wonder what your what your, both your methods are for, for trying to prevent burnout now. You know, what do you guys do to, to try and stop that? You got something that you you do, or I would say um, use your annual leave wisely, <laughs> and I know I mean that because so like I am terrible for using annual leave. I just never use it, and then I just accumulate it, and then take the last month or two of the year off. But what I've started to do recently is just to space my annual leave out more and take more regular sort of breaks from work because you come back feeling a little bit more refreshed and a little bit sort of more raring to go uh, and whether that's you've taken a break to go on holiday or you've taken the break just to just to have some time off and sort out life admin and you know bits like that set yourself targets you know where do you want to be two years four years eight years from now you know and how you're going to work towards achieving those targets is probably a good thing to do and try not to lose focus of that along the way you know get yourself uh, on as many sort of courses and, and bits in between to help your progression and help your motivation towards that progression and then as well as that it's try and I know it's easier said than done but just trying to remain positive in your role and remember that everything you do is for the benefit of your your patients you know and, and the service users and their their relatives and such and try not to walk away from it so easily you know like we said earlier it's really easy just to turn around and leave the profession whether you go and do the job but you go and do it elsewhere in another country or in another sort of um private sector part of it just try and try and stay because what we need is clinicians with experience you know to help train the younger generation to help uh you know those service users and patients that need it so try and stick it out try and reach out for the help and support that's there um whether it be from friends family support offered by your employer you know take regular breaks yeah no it's important what you say especially about um keeping keeping interested in the job and that sometimes that can be quite difficult to do but there's so much out there that you can do to keep yourself interested. There's so many CPD courses, and I know that um, a lot of trusts now are funding, is it like a grand of CPD uh, for registrants? Oh, um, I have no idea. Oh, I think that um, the HCPC are bringing out like a, a thing where um, paramedics, every year or every few years or whatever, a thousand pounds is gonna be given to each paramedic and you can do a CPD course, or put it towards a CPD course. Um, And yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head with the CPD or even like reading stuff. Um, You know, you go to a job and it might just seem pretty boring. It might be someone with some acute abdominal pain. But if you read up on the causes of abdominal pain, it's actually quite interesting. And that can keep your head in the job. It can keep you interested and and things like that. I know I read um, about early recognition of burnout is is really important um, to and, and not to deny it that, that you're not in burnout that's quite important and that just makes it worse doesn't it I don't know if you've ever felt like it before and you've gone ah uh, nah 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 it's fine tomorrow might be a better day I mean during during Covid I mean the only thing I had to do was, was go to work and go home so I ended up picking up loads of overtime because that was that was all I had to do really you know what, you know, I couldn't go out couldn't go away etc picked up loads of overtime and probably a little bit of denial that I was, you know, I was working mad amounts of hours a week because there was nothing else to do. And I was definitely hitting burnout, definitely came close. And I kind of put it off for a good couple of weeks before realising actually, do you know, 
I need to knock this back a little bit. Sorry, Sam, you're like going to say something. Sorry. Yeah, no, I was just going to say, I, I would say that weirdly though, I think out of everyone during COVID, like, I think we were quite fortunate. Like, obviously it was tough and, you know, you're going to patients that are very unwell. Like, I saw some of the most unwell patients I've ever seen. Um, but at the same time, in compare comparison to the rest of the nation, we were allowed to go out. Yeah. Uh, granted, we're going to work, but you know, at least we were still able to socialise, distanced <laughs> with with our colleagues at work. You know, and and we weren't trapped in the same house. And you know, like like James said, he picked up overtime because there was nothing else to do. Yeah. And granted, maybe working additionally contributed to some burnout, but at the same time, it probably benefited the other side of your mental health. You know, being able to go out and still see your colleagues and still do a little bit more than what the average public were able to do i would say 100 percent, i think and it's it depends what way you look at it because if you were someone who needed to get out then yeah you know we were fortunate but then if you were someone who was really stressed about getting getting covid Mm. then we were we were really unfortunate and because we were so exposed to it and everyone's got it and i don't know anyone i mean even in like after the second wave i think every ambulance person i knew had had it by then but um, this is when Sam goes, I've never actually had it. No, I had it. I didn't have it like, it's so weird. I had it like probably a year, a year later, a year after like it first appeared. Oh, okay, yeah. So I went like a whole year working like for it all and never caught it. And I was like, either like my cleanliness levels went just really OCD <laughs> or I have no idea, like yeah. just never took a mask off my face. I don't know. At first, when COVID really first started, I lo- I don't know what it was, but I loved it. I just loved the 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 weirdness about the whole thing, about this this novel thing is now affecting our country. And I was going in with my crewmate, and we were all dressing up in all the gear. And then like you know, I'd, ne- I'd never even seen some of this PPE before that we were putting on. Going into patients' houses, doing these, you know, that they were they were telling us to do these assessments alone. So one person stayed in the ambulance, and one person went out yeah. into the patient's house. And that was novel to me, you know. I'd, I'd never had that before. We'd gone in as a team, and now all of a sudden, I'm having to go in, assess this patient on their doorstep if they could. Um, and it was a night, and you know, I was dragging people out of their homes by myself with with oxygen levels of like seventy, because that's that's kind of how we took the rules at the time. And I know that they said, you know, you could call your crewmate to come in if you needed assistance, but it was. I just found it so weird, and I kind of disassociated myself from all the stress. But I found it almost quite almost like I was in a bit of a weird game world or something that I was just I was just doing all this weird stuff like it was so weird it, it was very surreal yeah like, surreal that's the word yeah, and, like, yeah. and it took time for me to go oh actually it didn't really it took me about a month or two to go do you know what I am now really sick of this fair James I mean what are your sort of tips what's your advice for trying to avoid burnout what would you recommend people do so I think t- Tommy's, we've, we've rattled through the points, the uh, Maslach points there, the, the identifying. I think it's just early self-recognition of avoiding burnout. I think I now know where I'm at the point of, uh, we're getting a bit close, you know, maybe similar to Tommy, you know, just becoming a little bit frustrated in the role, feel like I'm not getting anywhere, you know, not feel like I'm personally achieving anything, as we'd said before. And for me, it's just, I'm right, right I, need a, I need to change my role. I love being a paramedic, you know, I love what we do, but actually I just need to do something very slightly different within the service to make sure that I am achieving something, I am working towards something. Away from home, having something to look forward to, you know, you said about annual leave, get a holiday booked, yeah, it might be a a holiday in six months' time, but it's, oh, right, do you know what, it's now May in October, I'm going away, I've got this to look forward to, you know, making sure you use your days off to your full advantage, you know, don't just be sitting around stressing about work, checking your emails or looking for overtime, you know, get out and about, you know, if you like going to the gym, get in the gym, see your family, see your friends, just make sure you're taking that downtime and not just thinking about work constantly all the time. I mean, and that's a really good point to touch on is when you are on leave or even when you're on your rest days, turn your, don't have your work emails on your phone, turn turn it all off, turn everything oh, off, just completely disassociate from work you know you 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 want that time to be your time you don't want to be dragged back into the politics of what's going on in your workplace no i've 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 made the error of having work emails with notifications um and it was again it was during the, the busy peak of covid seeing how busy we were and i was like nah 
getting these I'm getting the, the email app deleted off my phone, turning the notifications off. And and simple thing like that made a massive difference. Yeah, yeah. And then like, you know, exercising, eating well, you know, all of the things that we should be doing, but you know, after a twelve hour shift who yeah, you just fancy a dominoes, didn't you? That's you just slip into bad habits, don't you do, you know, and it's just shift work makes it so hard. Like but again, is that an excuse rather than a you know a, does shift make yeah. work it really hard? If you, I guess if you were more of a motivated person, you could probably meal prep and do bits like that. That's it, yeah. And maintain, yeah. But equally, yeah. you do get exhausted. and Yeah, you do. Anyway, um, I think we've touched upon quite a bit here. We've um, defined burnout. Uh, we've, we've established the fact that majority of NHS staff are going to experience burnout if they haven't already. Uh, we've gone through the definition, the three points, and talked about them. And I hope that you guys listening can can sort of reflect on that and go when when will I get burnt out or have I been burnt out or am I burnt out at the moment Um, because it's really important Um, and touched upon a bit about Covid and to be honest I think that Covid could just be a whole new episode because there's a lot to talk about with our experiences there isn't it so yeah stay tuned do you know what would be great is if we can get uh, like an ITU nurse or doctor as a guest for a yeah. future episode that, to yeah, talk about really their, their experience in time during COVID. COVID, definitely potential. I think that's something we can definitely talk about. That's and... it. Um, and we've talked a little bit how we prevent burnout as well. So, you know, I hope that some people can take something from that. Um, so, as promised, at the end of every episode, we do a Q&A. Oh, before the Q&A, sorry, I was just going to say to anyone, you know, that feels like they're experiencing symptoms of burnout and go seek help you know there are plenty of support out there whether it be from you know resources that you have in your trust like well-being services or you know bits like that or whether it be charities you know you've got task for example the ambulance service charity um mind and i'm sure numerous other charities and, and support groups you can find just by having a bit of a google but don't don't suffer in silence 100 percent. talk it out um so yeah as promised, um, at the end of every episode, we do a Q&A session. Um, we've, we've only got one question uh, today, and the reason being is that we've spoken quite a lot about um, different things, and there was quite a lot of questions that were unrelated, and we're going to try to, in the future, just pinpoint the questions to each um, episode that we're talking about. So um, this one is from John in Shropshire. He's emailed in, and he's asked quite a good question. I am currently looking to change my career to becoming a paramedic. Looking at the options of entry, and currently I do not drive, but working on my driving license now, would this be a hindrance to going through the apprenticeship route? So I think what he's asking there is, he's changing his career to be a paramedic, he wants to do the apprenticeship route, he doesn't have a driving license at the moment, is that going to be a hindrance? So my understanding of the apprenticeship programme is is, is coming in direct as effectively a, a trainee, AAP, trainee technician, whatever term we want to use. Normally, you do your training and you're straight out. And my understanding is you need the driving license. So that's driving license as a manual car license, but then also the C1 category license, obviously up to, for those that don't know, vehicles up to 7.5 tonne on the C1 as well. And you've got to have both both of them normally for that entry requirements. Obviously, if John's going to look at a university program, direct entry university program, normally some of the requirements there are you have your driving license and you see one by the time you've finished your course to give you that time to do so. But I think if you're going to go direct in as a training technician, trainee AAP on the apprenticeships, driving license and see one. And it is likely from my experience that he will get knocked back purely based on the driving license. I think that's an easy one for them to go through paper shuffle and say, actually, not got your driving license sorry yeah you're 100 percent right sam they they might not even ask you to interview if you don't have your driving license oh yeah you are james yeah (laughs) Yeah, yeah. sorry james sorry tommy's hit tommy has hit burnout i am burnt out um yeah no no you're 100 percent right mate um yeah they don't even they might not even interview you if you don't have a driving license so john definitely get your driving license the issue, the issue is, is that you're probably going to have to get your C1 as well before you even apply. So you might be looking at maybe a year or a year and a half. I would say uh, minimum C1 provisional before applying because some trusts do yeah. offer funding for your C1 course. Yeah. Um, so you might get away with it, but obviously that, that's trust dependent. It should say on their application. Um, 
I think I'm not sure if there's a thing uh, I'd say refer to the DVLA website, but I don't know if you have to have your license for a certain amount of time before you're allowed to then go on and get your C1. I think it's a year. Worth a look. Worth a look. Um, but I'd say I'd say to John, just you know, the driving license is a, is a minimal, minimal, a minimal, minimal thing when I can speak. But use that time that you need to get your driving license to do other things as well. I think we spoke about it in in episode one. You know, if you if you want to change careers, maybe work in the care sector or do some work with Central Ambulance, use that time getting your driving licence as time to gain other experience to, to help your application as well. But definitely don't let it hold you back. Yeah, or c- come in the ambulance service as a call handler and or, or dispatcher. Uh, Tommy started off as a call handler and then went through dispatch and then out onto the road. So, you know, you could still sit in the ambulance service and that might put you in good stead for when you then are able to apply for the apprentice route. So yes, get your driving licence and at least your C1 provisional before you uh, apply. Um, but yeah, that wraps it up. Um, I hope you really enjoyed listening about burnout. It might be. I hope we didn't burn you out. Um, but yeah. yeah. More of those jokes are available. <laughs> yeah, on Tommy, you're not on this podcast anymore.com. So yeah. Um, but yeah, thanks again, Sam. Thanks again, James. Thanks again, me. Cheers, gents. Oh, well, thank mate, you. Thanks again, Tommy. I'll do your thank you. Oh, then, cheers. Yeah. Maybe we should do it in like a triangle. I don't know. That's it. Um, yeah. Um, but yeah, I hope you enjoyed the, the episode and we'll see you next time. Yeah, thanks, guys. Uh, tune in again soon. We have got some more special guests lined up um, in the coming weeks. And as always, drop us any questions to our email, pocketclinician at outlook.com. And don't forget to give us a follow on our socials at Bullhorns and Sirens and at Pocket Clinician. Bye. <laughs>